I'm Johnny Enoch, and you're listening to another episode of Inner Light Mysteries. And we have with us today a very special guest, my dear friend, Daniel Brinkley. And today we're on the road. And in the background behind me, for those of you that could see the video, we're in a hotel suite with video cameras set up, and we are interviewing some very interesting insiders who came forward to us on this series we're working on. And the one gentleman said he's at the end of his life. He's undergoing radiation and chemotherapy treatments. And he had a very important story to come forward with on how he was involved with programs where they were going out and retrieving UFO crashes, engaging with the beings, and so much more that goes behind the scenes. And his his other friend, who was also involved in these special access or unacknowledged programs, he had inside knowledge about a Stargate that was extracted out of Iraq, which is, of course, Babylon. Now, as we've been on the road filming this series, we, I've been with Daniel Brinkley, and he is the producer and director of this project, and it's a, a real honor to work with him. Daniel, can you tell the folks listening what your takeaway is with these two gentlemen? Well, the three gentlemen, remember, this is about everyday Americans. We have to start someplace to build a new platform for people to build off of, because the platform we've been operating on is gone, okay? And the legendary battle for the souls of humankind would be fought in healthcare. That's already occurred. The legend of Daniel is that. We're in the midst of that happening now. So we have to find innovative ways to build a new platform for people to build off of. And in the course of that, what happens to everyday Americans that change their lives? And what I know about it, Johnny, is that I'm an everyday American, but I, I had something happen to me that changed my life. So when we decided to do this, let's look at these everyday Americans. They happen to become a whistleblower and an insider, okay? because there are everyday Americans who keep this stuff to themselves, who have NDAs, who can't talk. And the ones that are coming forward, just like what we were doing when, when David Wilcox, right? What we were doing was listening to what everyday Americans were saying, literally their firsthand knowledge. So watching these guys and seeing where it's taken them in their life is a good place for people to reevaluate who they are and where they are. I'm glad to be a part of it. It's amazing to see people open up about these experiences and to feel safe that they mm -hmm. have a platform that they can share this in. And what I love working with Daniel is that Daniel does have this background, not only in the Marine Corps, and he has been on that side of things, but also as somebody who has gone through a spiritual transformation and who has seen both sides of this, it's, it's like you can have a very balanced perspective because when you're coming out of that world, I think people have a lot of PTSD as you've seen with these veterans, right? Well, I'm, I'm a, a old Marine and you see a lot of things that you never want to talk about. Everybody says that, but sometimes you see things you cannot talk about. And like the situation of where going through radiation and have multiple tumors in a view and some of them probably weigh 20 pounds and you decide to sit down and tell your story, then anybody that's not listening to that based on what he's facing is making a mistake in evaluating data. Okay, and then another one, like uh, the this next guy, this is someone who believes that we're in the third year of the tribulation. Okay, somewhere in that time pattern. So what would religiously, everyday American who has significant insight, angels and UFOs and all that stuff, but when you listen to the cadence and the power, you can tell where he draws his strength from in an absolute belief that he could differentiate between an entity that he considered evil and an extraterrestrial, that interaction. And watching his psychological nature of being able to deal with the that he can detail, to tell the difference between the two is what creates his credibility for me. And if we're in the third year of the tribulation, and there's only seven. I think he's a damn good person to have on your show. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very interesting. So these gentlemen on the series that we are involved with, and, and for those of you out there watching, this series is coming up from Zohar Entertainment. It's going to be online. You're going to be able to stream it and watch it very soon coming up. 
we we have this amazing opportunity right now to travel and as you see we have multiple 4k cameras behind us we have these this great lighting and this is guerrilla style filming we're hitting the road and we're reaching out to those of you out there who have a story for us and it's really exciting because none of this is planned none of this is 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 set up too far ahead in the future we're literally going out there and we're listening to real people like Daniel said and this guy he he sits down in the chair and Daniel could feel this I could feel it. I looked over at Daniel and it was very surreal he looks over and he takes a breath and when you tell a story like he told us about what it was like to see an extraterrestrial baby and that baby is transferring its emotions and its feelings into him where he could feel everything and what it was like to be coming into the earth when, and crashing and, and what it was like to go through that. It's very surreal, is it not? When, and you're watching it. I think what we're trying to convey in, this, in this, this series that we're doing for the next season is looking at everyday things that affect you and how they affect you. Because if we don't have a baseline in our spiritual self or in that so-called cosmic world, knowing that we have quantum mechanics now, we have no choice, okay? You have no choice yes. but to pay attention to this, and we have to build that platform. So when you watch him so connected, he was either a brilliant actor or he was conveying real emotion about an event that had happened in his life and the collective nature of his life, the collective nature someone who became devoutly Christian, if we're in the third phase, if we're in the third year of the tribulation, who devoutly was affected by that alien presence or that extraterrestrial presence. That, yes. that was what I got, that nature of that bonding. It wasn't something horrifying to him. He felt that being, being dependent and holding on to him. And I think that's what makes the story. Absolutely. I agree with you. What I was so impressed by with the second guy we talked to, his name was Philip. And he, these two guys that we were, we were interviewing that we had on the series that we're still, we're still in the process of filming right now, it, later today, even after this, we go back to filming, is that this gentleman has a religious conviction, as you mentioned, and he also studies the Bible code, the algorithm for reality, yet all his life he has had these profound experiences with angels and spiritual encounters, and he himself is very psychic and has a, a lot of ESP, but he doesn't dismiss the extraterrestrials as, as demons as so many out there in the genre do. Uh, I know there has been a lot of great Christian researchers out there that I know that you've run across, I've run across, you know, you got your L.A. Marzulis, your Tom Horns and others out there who discuss this sort of stuff, but they dismiss the extraterrestrial phenomena. And both of these take it very serious and they believe something's changing in our world. Well, I agree. And anyone who is not taking that serious is just making a foolish mistake. And, and why it gets very simple, Johnny. Uh, when the Galileo and the Hubble telescope and the Leonardo telescope, mm -hmm. all of them mapped what we know as our universe and mapped our universe, not just our solar system. There was like 10 trillion planets and stars, 10 trillion planets and stars. Mm. And we the only ones here. That's only a fool could think that. Okay. <laughs> So the amazing part about it is how it came about, what happened, and how they were dealing with it, and how well Phil found solace in the Bible code, which is this, 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 this system by which you can find prophecies in the Bible. And then everybody has two or three, but I think this is well worth bringing it to everybody and watch the person who had it, watch the person and watch the experience that person went through to come to the conclusions of where he is. And it may be an opportunity for them. We must find new platforms to stand on that are solid and that we can depend on. And I think doing these shows this way, we're accomplishing that. And it's some pretty wild stuff. I'll tell everybody, hey, everybody, way up here in Pennsylvania, Bigfoot's got it going on. <laughs> Everybody here has a Bigfoot story. <laughs> he says Bigfoot goes best with barbecue sauce. Yes. 
<laughs> but um, here's the thing with the Bigfoot, all joking aside, is that a lot of guys out there are trying to photograph Bigfoot. Even where I'm from in Vancouver, Canada, they call Bigfoot Sasquatch. But this first guy you're going to listen to who is very serious about these subjects, here's a guy with three military careers. And he says that these are coming from other vortexes. In different things so you're going to hear a different perspective on taking these paranormal subjects a little bit more serious but i want to ask daniel a question since we got him here and i, I love traveling with daniel uh, he's a lot of fun i know a lot of you out there who have listened to him over the years you've read his books you've heard him on shows you've heard him tell his story on how he has died and been to the other side and he's gotten a first hand look at where we come from before we get here and we were just talking about this religious guy that was uh, uh, that religious perspective who has a, a, a beautiful story to share with you all. And the topic of these sorts of things, Daniel, do you believe that there is a devil on the other side? Did you ever experience anything? Well, like I that? would hope so. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, I measure everything by its entertainment value. Okay. Because I've never in my journeys to that, that level of consciousness have ever encountered anything that would be like the devil. I'd have to say that in the, in the first experience, there was a place, there was a place, Johnny, where I guess I was trying to find where I was in the system. And as I looked, there was people below me or beings below me and they were slow moving. And then there were beings above me that were faster. It's like drinking 20 cups of coffee. OK, and I couldn't stay there. And then I leveled out in where I am. So I think that that uh, the opportunity to be able to look at this stuff, knowing that there's not only no devil. OK, and it's you who made you do it. You want to know who the devil is? Look in the mirror. You want to know who the most destructive animal on the earth is? Look in the mirror. Okay, that's who you see. And in the journeys that I've been over there and in the hundreds of people I've talked to who've had this near-death experience, uh, only a couple of them have run into the devil or run into that level of consciousness that is hell. Okay, and I call that the blue gray place. I mean, I recognize it like a bardo or like a purgatory in the Catholics, but the whole way you're taught about life and death based on institutions, religions, and governments is utter, absolute nonsense. So why I say it's entertainment value is you, you were chosen to come here and you chose to come here. And in the course of it, you get a chance to experience some miraculous things in your life. And you get the chance to achieve and make a difference, sometimes painfully, but still to make a difference. I mean, I won't say this life has been easy for me, but I've had some of the greatest things and people in my life to get me here. So nobody's going to die, Johnny. It does not happen. So the first thing you better realize is forever just got a whole lot longer and you're going to be you forever, okay? And the next thing you do is try to figure out why you chose to practice being a God, why you chose to come here, which is to practice being a God, doing to others, if you have others doing to you, love that neighbor as ourself, all those things, because it's really you, as the Hindus would say, it's really you you're loving and caring about, okay? So why would somebody do that? And it's so that you can get a chance to hug somebody. Danny and I have a question <laughs> for you. <laughs> I have a question for you then about when you cross over. A lot of people have heard you talk about the famous 360 degree panoramic life review. Now, when you're doing the life review, are these just little segments or are you seeing every last minute de detail and particle of dust? Every minute detail particle of dust. You, you are experiencing it. You're experiencing it as if you are it. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is how you, and it's why I say 360. That's the only thing I can use to give people some kind of idea of what I'm trying to say. Your capability of looking at and observing 
multiple streams of consciousness at the same time is unbelievable as we sit here. It is unbelievable how focused you can be in hundreds of levels of consciousness. And, you know, we know geniuses. We know people who are a little autistic, but brilliant in these kinds of fields. I mean, I knew a, a lady in Russia that spoke 17 fluid languages. Good Lord. I mean, and just right at it. Well, it didn't make any difference. She could interpret. She's an interpreter, and it didn't matter. And so that is genius. So uh, when, you, when you see all of that from the greatness that you are, the power as a spiritual being that you are and, and with a direction and a job function, then you get a chance to experience it differently than three-dimensionally. That's incredible. So when you're doing these life reviews and you've died more than once, you've died and crossed over, you've died and crossed over. Did it go away? Did it get easier? Did you start off where you last left off or did you have to restart the whole thing again? Yeah, everybody look. It didn't pick up where the last one left off. Oh, oh, it did. <laughs> <laughs> oh that must have been painful. I mean, the first one was horrible and yes, I had nothing to be thankful for. And then <laughs> I've discovered so many different things about what it teaches you, what dying teaches you about living. And I, I understand the thing called death. And I know as much about it as anybody that's breathing. There might be some people not breathing who know a little bit more about it than me, but there's no one breathing that knows more about it than me. And so by looking at that as a platform or a basis to build programming off of, Everything that we do and everything that you and I do has three or four premises to it. Number one, you're not going to die. Number two, it's about having fun and being entertaining. And then the other is about keeping heaven's door open. And as if it doesn't have anything to do with having fun, getting to heaven or making money, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> That's what his voicemail says, literally. So, so this platform is you will not die. And so we start there. And then after we get these first couple up, we'll come back in and go through the in-depth pattern of how to observe the videos and how to stay in consciousness, the thought patterns and the stuff you use to get the most out of what Johnny's bringing forth and what I'm helping him co-create. Because if you have the pattern by which to set yourself and you have the breathing nature and you sit back in that posture to absorb it, it will happen and to explain where to look at in the course of observing another human being telling their story and then what it teaches you. Then it's an instant, it's instant information perfectly assimilated for all the right reasons. I will tell you this, I'll tell you this. And he said that so beautifully, so eloquently, but I'm gonna tell you something about this guy is that I, I'm always fascinated by the near-death experience story, and his story always blew me away. I was always so fascinated. You got saved by the light, secrets of the light, and his story about going over. But he really is an extraordinary human being, almost like a superhuman mutant. I'll tell you what it's like standing next to him or someone who's died or crossed over. It's almost like maybe when your consciousness came back in, you were recalibrated, because uh, I'm going to tell you this is a true story. I'll be sitting next to him or I'll have another friend, uh, a British friend I have with me. He's sitting next to him and he is counting our breath from across the room. He's aware of how many heartbeats you are. He'll say, Johnny, take a breath. He could hear across the room. And well, it was three feet from him. And uh, well, yeah, good enough. But uh, it's, it's part of the room. And the other thing, he'll know things before they're about to happen. And it's almost like when we're doing this show, which I, which I love working with Daniel, we're doing a show and he'll know exactly the right direction of who we got to talk to or where we got to go with it. And I, I think it might be something to do with the NDEs. I'm not sure. But uh, did you find that after... I want to bring it back to your NDE one more time, Daniel, before we leave the subject. Did you find that you had sort of in your intuitive capabilities and, and how you do that? Is that something you inherited after them? Well, I certainly didn't have it before, or I didn't know what it was. Okay. Uh, 
the, the biggest issue about being perceptive or empathic, okay, becomes responsibility. And then the second most important thing is trying to control it. Do you know what it's like to never believe in any of this? Go from one day, never believe any of it. Not a single word of it. You couldn't get me to believe it. You was crazy. To becoming everything I never believed. <laughs> All of a sudden, <laughs> I was everything I never believed. I never thought about dying or if you died at 25 years old, that wasn't nobody 25 thinks they're going to die. I'm a Superman and all that. And then all of a sudden, you know, I deter, I see without any question that I am a spiritual being and in the nature of it, great, powerful and mighty is a, like you have a MD or PhD at the end here in the English world. Well, these, the ones that they put before you are the ones that are the, are accolades great powerful and mighty so you look up great you look up powerful you look up mighty and in those definitions they apply to you and if you're breathing and you're listening to this program this same system applies to you you are a great powerful and mighty spiritual being with dignity direction and purpose i can defend that in heaven or hell milwaukee or downtown pittsburgh <laughs> so always looking for the platform that we build off of and yes, I became empathic and uh, psychic and uh, all those things that supposedly are, are phenomena. It's only frequency movement. It is it, remarkable. And speaking of which, um, the first episodes that we were filming of the show that we did the first season on going down memory lane focused on the lives of Jordan Maxwell and Zachariah Sitchin. And why you are the perfect guy to direct and produce these areas is because you've known all these people. I mean, you know everybody, everybody that's been in this area. Over the years, you've had interactions with them. Mm -hmm. Jordan Maxwell, you knew him for 40 years. Yeah. You traveled with Zachariah Sitchin. And yeah, got arrested in Syria with Zachariah. Can you tell this story of what <laughs> happened? Well, I don't think you've ever told this story on the air, no, have you? No, watch. I was a, I, I loved the Middle East and I loved, uh, and well, I think I liked the jungle too, but I, uh, I knew Zachariah because he was on the tour and I was big shot and I was filling up, uh, not stadiums, but I was filling up a uh, thousand seats and people were being able to face and confront this horrible, scary thing called death because I thought it was funny. You know, if I didn't die and I didn't go to hell, then nobody else was gonna die and nobody else was going to hell. And now 45 years later, I could tell you that's the absolute truth. And if you think anything other than the fact that you're not gonna die, you are neglecting the divinity that flows through you in the story. So when you all of a sudden discover that you are a spiritual being and you don't really have anywhere to go, you have no one to talk to about it. Talk to your preacher, you tell you to talk to your dog, you talk to your doctor, they both tell you to send you to a psychiatrist, and you never get to work through it. And that's how I met Raymond Moody. Okay. Raymond Moody asked the right questions. He, uh, Raymond Moody, who created Life After Life, who coined the term near death experience, was going to medical school 10 miles from where I lived, the way I was struck by lightning. So I've known Raymond since. 1976 when I met him and spent 20 years with Raymond pushing the near-death experience out into the mainstream to where it's now a standard possibility and I just saw something the other day where where science has proven that you have life reviews as your life has passed away it's now a scientific fact and so uh when you look at it from all those different angles right and you think about what is the most important point you can you get from it is being a great, powerful, and mighty spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose is who you are. And being able to pay attention and come to these programs. And what we're trying to do is in the I am trying, everybody, to take stories that people are telling and fit them into the panoramic life of you. So that as they're telling their story and they get say they have someone who will listen and some people have not 
I mean, I may not believe or know all this, but I'm smart enough to know if you're telling the truth or not. I'm smart enough to know that. And so I call them the human lie detector test. Uh, you, everybody puts out a certain frequency and you can listen to the sound of a person's voice and then you can watch how that person conjugates the verb. Where, where does he position the verb or where does she position the verb? Because the verb tells you the action which structures intent, it tells you action and intent. And when you have that formula as fast as I have it, I can tell what's real or not. And I'm not perfect like a lie detector test, but I'm paying attention. And you know, some people are not getting it exactly the way it happened 12 years ago, but they're getting it close enough that you listen to the truth from a person who served their country as veterans and these experiences has happened to them and they reacting to it. And it means that we are being lied to. Absolutely. Uh, and that's why we have to question more. And that's why we have to go into these experiences and these stories the way that we are. I, I want to share another story about him. I don't know if he wants me talking about him, but I will. Because we, we've been having a lot of fun on the road, joking around. You're going to hear about that. You're going to see that when you watch the show. But we'll be out with, with Daniel. And I've seen this before with him, you know, in certain places we've been, but someone will come up and they always want to give Daniel a great big hug. And, uh, you know, when we've been backstage at an event, you know, everybody wants to give him hugs first, even before everyone else starts lining up to get the hugs. But when he gives someone a hug, you always feel this electricity. I think it's a little bit of that lightning left that got him, the lightning that's moving through him, little uh, pieces of electricity. But he'll, he'll, he'll give someone a hug. Then all of a sudden we were astounded. He's giving them a message about their life and it's flashing through and he does it very subtly, but picking up on that. And I think that's what we got to do now, you know, just, just like Daniel's doing with those those hugs that he's giving. We got to tune into that intuition when we're questioning and let it guide us, especially in these times, uh, the times that we're in where sometimes we might think it's dark out there. That's when all of you got to use your light and go forward. Daniel, in the books that you wrote, actually, well, now that we're talking about you again. Thank uh, God. Thank God. I mean, uh, what else is there to talk about? But lots of I know, but well, in the book that you've written, you talk about these boxes of light. And, uh, you know, if I, I would be kicking myself later if I didn't ask you about these, because you did predict where we're going right now in the world. You saw things happening in I would say that you saw accurately what's going on today, wouldn't you? Chapter five, box 12, Saved by the Light. Exactly. Written in 1993, published in 1994. The title of the chat, the title of the, of the box is Technology and the Virus. And it describes exactly where we are, exactly what was going to happen and exactly why. Because in that first near-death experience or the first death experience, Johnny, I mean, I, I had these visions and I was in this crystal city and uh, all of a sudden these beings would appear and then this information would come at me and it, it's like a laptop. And it was as though it would open up and I was present in these events and I'm looking at it and trying to figure out what it is, but it was different from the place that I was when I wasn't in the box because it had a, there, there was no bombs and no, you know, it was sensual is what it was. I hate to say that heaven is sensual, everybody, but heaven is sensual. Okay, that's the <laughs> only word in English. You could say erotic or exotic, but it's exotic sensuality, okay? And that's what it's like over there, okay? You don't, don't get in as big a hurry to get there as I'm making it sound. But remember, that's where you're headed. So when you, <laughs> sorry, I was having too much fun. <laughs> yeah, no. So the one thing with that, what you're saying, and I would always ask you, hey, Daniel, you've been to, you've been to heaven. Is God an old man in a chair with a big beard that's sitting there? And there's something he started to tell me that was similar to what I was getting from, let's say, when I talked to my friend Muhammad in Egypt. I was asking him, uh, because I, I'm a student of comparative religions, I would ask him about in the Quran, it says, you know, there's this word for 72 virgins that people always say is there. Well, first of all, it's not exactly framed like that in there, but the 72, that is a processional cycle, 
the word that they use for virgins is horai, uh, and it's like Horus. That's where he believes it came from. And this is the, the light. But also, if you think about this, why there would be a feminine aspect to that, why you think you'd have that, Daniel would tell me that it's more of a feminine, would you say, motherly perspective? Like oh, no, more than that. I mean, uh, all that story of seeing God and all that stuff that people say, that's them framing it. There's no language for it. Okay. So you find words that you language with, because I spent years doing that, Johnny. I need people to get an understanding they're not going to die. And I have to say it in Kill Billy. So having to say it that way, then I'm just telling the truth about it. And when you mess around with the foolishness that people are trying to get you to believe in religions, institutions, and governments so that you're scared to death of death, then that platform is the one they're using. So I'm engaging that platform, okay? This, this stuff will be about health, everybody, and things that you need to look at. And everybody in the world knows I am a trace mineral junkie. And he I, is. I threaten everybody with trace minerals. <laughs> Because, he, he got us all on trace minerals or dropping mm -hmm. them in our water. And it's got to happen, everybody, because that's what that's what makes the body with magnesium and potassium. That's what makes the skill set of the spiritual nature of you flow <laughs> outward. He makes it sound like a good recipe, like it's a oh, Martha on. Stewart living or something, and he's putting it together, an old self. Mm -hmm. But hey, Dan, while we're on the subject of health and healing, it's it's a mission statement from your earlier writing and what you were talking about connected to Edgar Casey uh, and also connected over to these healing centers in the future. Yeah, the final the final project. What does that look like? I had to get to I had to get to chapter twelve. I had to get to box twelve when I wrote. I wrote this stuff down in 1976 when I was having to learn how to write again. It took me two years to learn to walk and feed myself. Ooh. And between peeing and crapping on myself and passing out and breaking my nose, and I had to do something. So I was learning to write the things that I'd seen as the boxes. So when I sat down with Paul Perry to write uh, Save by the Light, then I had the notes to go by. I had the notes from 1976 to go by as Paul and I sat down and I wanted to tell the story. Well, they tried to take the boxes of knowledge out 10 times and I wasn't going to have it because some of them were too close to happening based on what I said in 1975, what I wrote down in 1976 and what became a book in 1993 and published in 1994. There were certain things in there that were that were too close to be happening to the publishing date of the book. But I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Why? Because I'm mad. Okay. <laughs> and they said, and Paul said, what are you mad about? I said, I'll tell you something, Paul. Here they come. Here's Raymond. Raymond's a good guy. Okay. He's funny. All his friends are dead. Socrates and Plato. And Aristotle. <laughs> Didn't have any friends. <clears throat> and by the time I saw him in 91, the world had beaten him. It had beaten him. Cardiologists and doctors and philosophers and everybody had literally lost, you know, this, this spiritual search is pretty damaging to relationships. I can tell you, I'm a witness to it. But uh, he had lost everything and I saw him and, uh, Raymond represented where people Johnny could turn and have faith in the experience that they had. They had the, they could believe they had faith in what Raymond was talking about and that they had, they could feel certain comfort from that they'd had resuscitation or they'd had an experience that canonized who they are and where it is and, and the emotional self. And so I decided that people need to pick on somebody their own size. You know, I, believe, I, I would have never believed this. I, you couldn't get me to believe it. I wouldn't care. And now it's happened to me three or four times. And uh, I'm, I stand up for those people so that their voices can be heard. I don't care what people think about what I'm saying, except that you can't eliminate that. I wrote it down in 1976 and it, you can go, go to Amazon and get saved by the light and turn to chapter 12 and go to box, turn to chapter five and go to box 12 and tell me what I missed. 
And here, and here's the most amazing thing about you and these experiences. And this is why I feel honored to work with you. And I love working with you because people know you as Mr. NDE, King of death. the King of death. That's what we call him around here. And the funny thing is, is that you told me a while ago that you stay in your lane because you have an important message to share with people. You give them hope. You're at that. You do hospice at the bedside. How many bedside people? That you've been to the bedside of a veterans? 2012. How many people have taken their last breath around you? 351. Just like a Swiss watch, I tell you, the numbers with, with this guy. But uh, I, I always get those out of him. But here's the thing about this guy is that he literally has, when I ask him questions, um, uh, amazing stuff with archaeology, ancient history, mysteries. He's been around the best. Uh, he, he literally could pick up the phone and call Zahi Was, any of these sort of people. So he's, okay, watch this, watch this. How many times have you been to Egypt? Probably 31. Mexico? 50. And that's not even including the Middle East, Asia, all around the world. So we could literally go into subjects that would blow your guys' mind if you heard the stories from behind the scenes of what he's been told, what extraordinary people have told him behind the scenes. 4.5 million miles. Uh, 94 countries. So uh, amazing. 34,000 hours as a hospice volunteer. Amazing stories. Amazing stories. Not just the other side of the veil, but on the other side of the world. And all of you are more fun than me. So we got to get us a platform to operate off everybody. And we got to open up our hearts and we got to realize we're practicing being a God. And when you start listening to these programs, when we come in to say, okay, it's time to breathe. Okay, it's time to be calm. It's time to think about this as you listen to this and then you do it that way and we will get a faster opening inner spiritual awakening opportunity so that well you got to do all that too and, and remember to breathe right but i wanted to ask you dan <laughs> what's the what's the craziest thing that you can share with the folks that you've heard or experienced or seen in these in these places where there's megalithic ruins like egypt Syria, Damascus, Baalbek. What's what's the craziest facts? Well, what I are? mean, say, look at Baalbek. What is Baalbek? Baalbek is a temple, a temple of Bacchus that the Romans built it sometime uh, in BC or before the Common Era. Okay, that they, they built it. You go there. It's uh, nice. You had to be between 12 and 17 feet tall to walk up the steps. <laughs> okay. And the part about it is there are 12 columns made of Egyptian blue marble in this place that has like a 36 foot tall feet ceiling. And it's thinned alabaster. That's so light can come into the temple. Hmm alabaster that fit over the entire gigantic 36 foot 40 foot tall temple okay and it stayed that way till 1878 when an earthquake came and broke it broke it and the last time anybody would been there when i think zay and i mean when uh zachariah and i because that's the story we were telling the story of zachariah going to jail but when we, when we, Zachariah and I and Abbas Nadim and some girl named Chris, we were going, uh, we were going to, from Syria, from Damascus to the border, go to Lebanon and Lebanon into the anti-Lebanese mountains to a city of Baalbek. And so I got, I got uh, Zachariah's passport fixed and my passport fixed and Abbas with his big shot self decided he would get his and Chris, I think her name was Chris, Chris is done. So it was all about one mark that you put on the next to the last page, that that's what this person who is filling out your visa, okay? And the guy who did mine and uh, Zacharias put, it on the, put the mark on the last page and uh, Abbas's didn't. So Zachariah and I sat for nine hours under olive tree under a tree in the middle of the syrian desert <laughs> <laughs> and we became really really close friends i had known him from the tour you know i had seen him on like everybody i've been out here 40 years and 
I'd see him on the tour and we would sit together sometimes at the table because at the end of a show, the producer, everybody has to come up to the producer's suite, you know, so the producer can, not talking bad about producers, but they had their little flock of the greatest names in, in the day in, at that point in, in the day. And so Zach and I, and I would sit together, but we became close friends. And when I see people attack him or I say people talk about what he interpreted, he, when you look at how words change and how periods change and how observations of information changes, okay, because we are in a speed, high speed place to look at it. If it hadn't been for Zachariah, no one would have anything to criticize and we still wouldn't know what we know. And when we were honoring Jordan, who, who not only could understand the conspiracies that were at play, he understood the background of how they came into existence and some as old as, as masonry, some as it goes back to Egypt, okay? And when you put, when you put a, a Sumerian history and Babylonian and all that energy and information that came from that, that, that interpretation by Zechariah, and you look at what Jordan said and you look at the lives and the age what they are telling us is how we got set up. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you listen to this, you see how we got set up because everybody, if you think you're not set up, if you don't think that you haven't read Saved by the Light. Okay. Abs absolutely. You need to get it. And that's exactly why now, now that you've heard, this is just a little fraction. This is the tip of the iceberg and infinitesimal little tip. Of, of where he's been and who he's encountered. And that's why even today, later on tonight, we're gonna to be filming late into this evening with our, with our other contact who's gonna be sharing his testimonies. I would like to have him and Daniel side by side for some episodes and interviewing them both, sharing their testimonies because Daniel has also been to Iraq when Babylon was reconstructed there. And it was, it was in its magnificent glory there, right? Yeah, well, there was two purposes in going. You know, everybody. Uh, I, I get, I'm pretty good at gathering information, and I'm pretty cool about gathering that information. So, I was to go and take pictures in a certain area in the museum in Baghdad, and then there was a smaller museum right on the outskirts, and to take pictures of everything in there. And then to go to uh, Babylon, I always wanted to sing the Hanging Gardens and King Nebuchadnezzar and all the glory and the grandeur of the closest I could get to the Alexander the Great period. And it was beautiful. It had some of the original walls still there. Okay. And it was reconstructed. Even the gates? Mm -hmm. Wow. It's magnificent. And uh, one thing that'll come out tonight, and I'm not going to say it, is when when phil tells his story and you meshed it with that i was there and i would probably have a picture i mean i don't have any pictures once i hit uh iraq or persia i don't have any pictures because you turn those pictures in you know those little uh, handy cams <laughs> so so hey, there are things where a lot of stuff in my life crosses path with a lot of things that we're uh, running into. So the whole point of this is that there are probable possibilities of where we go because they think that one of the most important things I learned is I saw and came at least 50 years into the future. I have come at least 50 years into the future to see what was going on and how and what was motivating by it. That means that the existence of possible timelines and multiple timelines come into suspect or perspective based on it happened and I wrote it down. And remember, Saved by the Light is 26 years old. It didn't just happen today and I've been saying it for 40 years. The, the biggest point of that is people are not realizing that they are great, powerful and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction and purpose. And the only thing that could ever go wrong in your life is you allow something to affect your dignity, 
which skews your direction and your purpose. That's not to say that your life will not be insane, <laughs> but you got to remember, that's why we came here. I mean, <laughs> if you're birthing a new age, everybody, and you can believe that that age is being birthed, we're watching it on television every night. We're back in the 60s doing <laughs> the same crap we always did. We bomb and blow up little countries and we kill people instead of talking it through. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating to see what we're doing to moms with kids in 2022, when all it is is call him on the phone, be all good friends, call Donald Joe, and tell Donald to call him and get this stuff stopped. My only issue is whether we have active duty special forces or active duty Marines, active duty Marines on ground. That's an issue I have. Now, if they're contractors and they're on ground, it's still another point because if they're Americans and they're there and they're active military, that's NATO breaking the rules. We have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that me and Zahi, I'm sorry that me and Zachariah were going to uh, Baalbek, but I just had that hit me in the mood. I'm sorry, but I got a chance to know Zahi. I mean, I got a chance to know Zahi Awash really, really close. Zachariah Sitchin, John Anthony West, Robert Baval, uh, Abbas Nadim, Hosni Mubarak's wife, Susan, and a whole array of people in my probably 30 trips to Egypt. And when you when you know Zachariah and you watch him be just another guy, he wasn't a PhD, he wasn't a scholar, he wasn't any of that. He was someone who was brilliant in understanding uh, petroglyphs and hieroglyphs and understanding how you would construct a language because he knew there would be some sacred geometry or series of numbers or all the stuff he used to talk, he would know it, but he's just another guy who had something extraordinary happen to him. And in the course of that, he became aware of a lot of things that now we build off of as our historical place. But even more important than this is this legendary planet. So what we will do is do a whole series on Nubiru, Nuburu, Planet X, because this is something that I've never seen anybody come at Zachariah's interpretation of it. And watching what Zachariah says and sees about it, because he somehow he could relate to those people. It was like a past life or something like that, Johnny. He could relate when you when he talked, he talked as though he was living in the time period, as opposed to observing the time period, which is what many critics of his translations are doing. We all have slangs. We all have ways we say stuff. OK, that's not the strictness of the of the tablet. So he's fun. He's wonderful. And I'm so glad we did the shows to praise uh, Zachariah Sitchin and Jordan Maxwell. And please, everybody, watch them in thankfulness. That's right. We had Paul Tice on there. We went out to San Diego. We were at the Book Tree Publishing where you could still feel this place. It was like walking back into a time machine into the 90s where paul hasn't changed a thing and he if you ever get a chance to visit there do it out in san diego book tree publishing it's brilliant he's got so many books you're not going to find anywhere else and of course when we were there everyone wanted uh Daniel's books and they wanted them signed and uh, i don't think any of Daniel's books are left there but he had all kinds of stuff like the old parker oh, publishing books uh just stuff that you would you know just <laughs> such a diverse variety of books on every subject. I, I thoroughly enjoyed Paul and he's in this he's in this part of the series. And when you listen to him as a photographer and as a friend of both of these people, you get a chance to see human beings with extraordinary skill sets and information and how it's affected and changed their lives. I can remember that when uh, Zachariah called me and he was so excited about two things. 
he was thrilled that when they mapped the genomes, they found 129 bacteria that were not on this earth. And it was in the New York Times. And he wanted to know how he could make his fax machine work so he could fax it to me. And he couldn't figure out how to, <laughs> he couldn't figure out how to do it. And the other thing that Zachariah gave me was the octopus has no genetic relationship to the earth. It has no genetic relationship. We eat them. But when you start to think about alien, okay, and you find that a, a, an octopus is as smart as you are, and it has like eight brains, every arm has a separate brain, so it operates togetherly and independently. And, you know, it colonizes and builds little cities and stuff like that. And you start to think about that. And it has no DNA that has anything to do with the earth. Now, where did it come from? You know, with the octopus, when we look at it, like you said, Dan, it's coming from probably billions of light years away from here, millions of years old. But I want to I want to share with you guys something that we'll be discussing on the show that what you'll hear is Which that show you've talked like about 10 shows. John. No, well, this, the one we were just Jimmy talking Church about on the show with you. No, he's the show before us. Oh. He's the show before us that comes up there. But on on this on this episode where we have Zachariah such and here's something Jordan Maxwell says directly. He says to me at one point that that Zachariah Sitchin was a contactee of the Anunnaki. And Paul Tice says that he knew that Zachariah had these Anunnaki that were speaking through him. But I want to play a short clip for you all of what Jordan Maxwell said. This is me talking to Jordan Maxwell uh, when he was in a private conversation. Uh -huh. Do you think that uh, between what you gathered from Sitchin or what you think yourself and in, in your spirit, do you think these Anunnaki were uh, reptile people or were they humanoid like us? Uh, you know what? I'm not sure. And I wish I would have asked. I wish I would have asked that. I didn't stop to ask that kind of a question of him. Oh, I, I know. I know that he was, uh, you know, on a one on one relationship with them. Yeah, oh, for sure. Oh, no, I know that for sure. He told me he was. It's amazing that he talked with them one to one face to face. Now, that's a pretty startling revelation. Jordan told me that he didn't want that to be quoted about him until he passed, that he said there were certain things that he said, you know, after I'm gone, go ahead and share it. But he said that there was- He certain... might have said it that way. Yeah, he basically, <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, you can talk about it, but he he, he said, you know, the, the people confided him in these things, uh, the sec other secrets that he never talked about. And, and he kind of was implying that Zechariah was getting direct messages from the Anunnaki to help him. But I, I agree with you. Could it have been a past life thing Zechariah had? It, when, I, when, you sit, when you sit in the Syrian desert for nine hours in the sun. As you did with him. Mm -hmm. And you, after that, became a weekly or twice monthly conversation because he could call me up excited and tell me stuff. <laughs> and I would listen and I, have, I would come back with good questions. And he got a chance to explore it. And, you know, I, I'm a hospice volunteer, so it's very easy for me to be a listener. And uh, I just loved him. And when I watched and listened to the information, you could see him own it in not a way as it was intellectual. He owned it as though it was a part of him, that he was able to translate these languages from absolutely on his own by himself Look at what other people had written or said and putting it in and fractally putting it together that they had three or four really good languages that they used that he could interpret. So when I when you're around that and you can feel him be it, then that tells you a different story than an observer or an academician. I, I agree with you. And, you know, this is the thing about Zachariah is that like when you look at the last book of Anki, that that's this story that's just just narrated so beautifully that it was obviously coming from somewhere, almost like an automatic writing. And 
I think when people have a natural gift in something that comes to them easily, you know, probably is a past life or something that comes something, really easily. Something like that. I, I, I listen to what skeptics say or listen to people who have an opinion about Zachariah. Okay, I listen to that. All right. But that's somebody that's not using into it. They're using the ability or A and I or some form to better interpret or to translate the word, the, the letter structure into what appears to be a structured language, like sentences. Okay. This is where all those issues come. It's like male and female in, in the romance languages. What gender it, the sentence is has a complete different meaning than, than if it was masculine or feminine. It's a completely different meaning. You could see him own it, Johnny. You could see him be, be the period that he is describing. And that's the point that I see that people aren't given that credit because they wouldn't have a chance to be critical if he hadn't have been on his own with his own time, his own money, his own life, making this happen. I agree with you. And this is, this is the perspective you're going to get when you watch this first series we have called Down Memory Lane, where we have Paul Tice. And he's also going to be in defense of Sitchin, the, out of the critics, that he has got some great counterpoints. He was Sitchin's personal photographer. Traveled he with him everywhere. Traveled with him. They were good friends, just like Daniel and him or Jordan and him. And speaking of Jordan, we also have some incredible stories about how he met the Princess of Abu Dhabi. We got pictures you've never seen, things you've never seen, alien stars. I mean, he he was getting a good uh, a good smile out of a uh, lot of the memories. You'll enjoy it, everybody. We build it, and I'll say it one last time, a platform. Things that we could build off of that are real, as cosmic as they seem or sound, they're real, and they're happening to everyday people, just like that's what's happening to you. And like I wrote Twilight, I wrote uh, Say by the Light because I was mad, and I wanted people to be able to speak about the near-death experience and have the safety that I had their back. And so... That book went really, really well, but it also came 50 years into the future. And it tells us exactly where we are and gives us the choices that we have. You know, everything's free will. And then it just structures itself down to choices. And when you come down to just the choices, it's which one of those that we collectively focus our energy on to either shift and change our consciousness for the good or complacency where we are now is causing this to happen. So we have to have a call to action. So I hope what we do and what Johnny creates and, and in this programming that we create calls to action. Let's don't not, when let's get off the program and take the action that we're asking you to take. It might be calling a congressman and saying they need to stop all this and quit killing women and children. And, just what are you doing? It's not 1930. What are you doing? What are you doing? I completely agree. We got to go and look from our heart. We got to ask questions and move forward and take action with uh, everything that we know that is good and true to ourselves in that action. And with that being said, also make sure you go on Amazon and buy his books, buy them for a friend, give it to somebody, go on YouTube, look up Saved by the Light. Light Watch streamers. Them. Light. Go to light streamers and and write Mr. Mebbin. Well, well, how do they find that? Lightstreamers.com. Lightstreamers.com. Uh, a 40-year friend who was around at the very first time. Uh, and he's married to Alice Ray, who was at the hospital, was on the other end of the phone. Uh, she was in the same room of the person I was talking to at the end of the phone. So she has been with me through this entire event. And Mel is uh, her husband, and he's a really good guy. And as I was going through the open heart surgery and coming out of it now in that third year and coming out of it, then Mel took over all that stuff and managed it for me. So it's lightstreamers.com. He's a really fun guy. And he has a, he built a little page to me, and there's a lot of stuff there and a lot of links. Yeah, also the Daniel Brink, Daniel Brinkley groups on Facebook and social media. Mel posts a lot of great stuff, and people are out there talking about NDEs and sharing. And I'm asking you to do all kinds of stuff, everybody. So if you're going to go over there, you know I'm going to ask you to do two or three things. It might be call your congressman. It might be 
send somebody some love, you know, but <laughs> I, I'm going to ask you now it's about breathing right now. We've come through the laws. Here are the laws of the universe. Here are the basic structure of the laws of the universe. As you give love, so shall you receive love as you are, as, as you uh, is, let's see. Well, there's 21 laws and now we're on breathing. We're on breathing and realizing that every breath you breathe, you are praying. If the definition of prayer is the National Institute for Health Office Alternative and Medical Policy, the definition of prayer, so you can do a research double blind study on the power of prayer is willful conscious intent. If you know the definitions of willful conscious and intent, that's what you're doing per breath. That's beautiful. You willful knowingly where you are and what you're doing. You are conscious because it's an action you're taking that you are breathing. That's and your intent is why you are breathing and doing it. Everybody take a deep breath with us. And, and with remember that, remember, we love you. Remember, we love you. Also remember that coming up from May 17th to the 29th, we have the Immortal Light Tour of Egypt available at sabatours.com. There's not many spaces left to come, but you want to be there because this is going to be very exciting. We, I'm going to be there knowing you guys with all kinds of facts about ancient Egypt and strange mysteries. We have Muhammad Ibrahim. We have Paul Elder from the Remote Institute. We have Professor Hank Kracher. We have Timothy Hogan, who is an esoteric scholar and expert on alchemy. We have J.P. Hag, And of course, Eugenia Lotus going to be giving all sorts of lectures. And also join us with Eric Von Doniken, Giorgio, and everyone's coming out to the Awakening Conference from the folks, uh, not only Zohar, but uh, the Chariots of the Gods uh, folks. They're going to be there. Lots of amazing speakers. And that's going to be a Blackpool, June 24th to the 26th, 2022. Everybody come. There's not many seats left. I'm so excited to see you all there in the UK this summer. Thank you all for listening, everyone. And until the next time, remember to like, subscribe, and share this with your friends. We love you.